This is our last see, uh, speaker of the 2021 um, fall series for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies CLABS. I am David Ortiz. I am the faculty fellow for CLABS. And it is my pleasure to have all of you here attending. And it is my pleasure to also have our speaker for today. So a couple of things before we begin. Um, there is a button on your Zoom uh, that's a Q&A button. Um, that is the way that you will be able to ask questions to Dr. Bobby, which is our, who is our, our speaker today. Um, the chat is really disabled for you, so you won't be able to use the chat, but you will be able to use that Q&A button. So please, at any point during her presentation, make sure uh, to use that button. Um, we will collect all of those questions and we will uh, then ask them at the end. Uh, in your chat though, you can see a few things that we just posted. Uh, and what we posted are all of our social media uh, addresses. So our Twitter account, our Instagram account, our Facebook account, and our brand new YouTube account. So uh, why I say this is because if you're interested in what um, is gonna happen next semester, or if you're interested in seeing Dr. Bovi's talk, um, if you can't do it fully today or anything, uh, it will be posted on our YouTube channel there too. And we will advertise all of this through our social media. If you're also interested in joining our mailing list, we've also posted it in the chat, so you can see it there. And if you're interested in knowing what we have uh, planned for next semester, our coming events, uh, it's also there in the chat. So make sure you pay attention to that. Okay, so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for today. Um, our speaker for today, we're very, very happy and very honored to have her is Dr. Kate Bovey. Uh, Dr. Kate Bovey is an assistant professor in the language, languages and linguistics department here at NMSU. So she is our very own and we're very happy that she has joined us. She specializes in the syntax, semantic and semantic pragmatic interfaces of contact varieties, including Yucatec Spanish and New Mexico border Spanish. Her recent work focuses on the semantics of epistemicity, expression of belief, and evidentiality. While she works primarily on Spanish, she has studied also Yucatec Maya and briefly worked with speakers of Tsutsuhil Maya in Guatemala. Her current project is starting the NMSU Bilingualism Lab here at NMSU, and that focuses on undergraduate and graduate student research of New Mexico border Spanish. So, that all sounds really, really exciting. We are very, very uh, honored to have you today. Uh, Dr. Bovi, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I'm really excited to be here with everybody. All right, so um, my presentation today, I've called it Ila Ila Wile, which is um, observa or observe. Um, just a little attention grabber, how Yucatec Maya affects Spanish in the Yucatan. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be showing you um, some of the contact effects of when we have Maya and Spanish in close proximity, how the languages change. I'll talk a little bit about Maya and how it's changed and a little much more about Spanish and how it changes. Throughout this presentation, especially if you are in an area where um, Spanish and English is spoken, like Southern New Mexico, Go ahead and uh, if anything comes to your brain about like making connections between maybe the Spanish spoken here in New Mexico, make those connections because there are a lot of similarities happening. I'll do a couple uh, throughout the presentation, but um, just a little bit about the talk. So I don't need to talk about me because that was a beautiful introduction. Um, I do study semantics, um, which is meaning. And then I also study syntax, which is structure of sentences. So I'm going to give a big overview. I'm going to geek out a little bit more on that information because that's what I enjoy doing. So the purpose of this talk is um, to give you a brief introduction of, of what the Yucatan is and what it has to offer. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the languages, and I'm going to talk to you about what happens when these two languages come in contact. So an overview, um, I'll present first about Yucatan. I'll talk a little bit about Yucatec Maya. I, I wish I could talk all day about Yucatec Maya, but um, it'll be brief. I'll talk about some traits of Yucatec Spanish, and then we'll get into kind of a linguistic overview where we start with the sounds and we end with the sentences, talking about the effects of this language contact. All right, so Yucatan, um, it is the peninsula um, which actually has the state of Yucatan as well as Quintana Roo and Campeche. And Yucatan is unique because, for example, near Mexico City, you have tons of indigenous languages spoken there. But in all of the peninsula, we have just Yucatec Maya spoken. Of course, there are var varieties. There's a dialect, an Eastern dialect, and kind of a more Northwestern dialect. That definitely happens. But for the most part, it's a big chunk of land that's just speaking Yucatec Maya. I have some pictures on the side. Yucatan, the state of Yucatan is known for its uh, ruins, which you can see here. These are all ancient ruins with the exception of this. This is a, a convent. Um, and then they're also known for their cenotes, which are sinkholes. And they are amazing. They're beautiful. And they say that if you drink water from the cenote, you'll fall in love. And it happened to me, I drank water from this, not literally, but I have fallen in love with Yucatan. I go back every chance that I get. So uh, a little bit about the site that I do research. I do research in a town called Valladolid. It is about 45 minutes from Chichen Itza, one of the seven wonders. So if you're doing a little tour, probably you'll stop in Valladolid. I would encourage everybody to spend more time there because it's amazing. It's got a lot of influence from the Spanish. You can see that clearly, most clearly in the architecture and the design of the city. However, the people you will see in just a second, it's definitely not all um, representative of colonial cultures, right? So here I've got a picture of the convent from in Valladolid and uh, the cenote that we've got in town. So Valladolid comes from the name in Spain, um, but the original name of this town is Saki, which is the, the name in Maya. So here's a couple pictures of the people um, and they're wearing their wipi, right? So this is a, a celebration here we've got going on. Any kind of celebration that they've got like a vaqueria, they're going to be dancing the harana. Um, it's a traditional dance. It is pretty commonly danced at a lot of the celebrations. And it's important to note that people are wearing these traditional um, outfits every day. This is, this is what people wear. Um, if they're from the Maya communities, this is what people are wearing. So I'll talk a little bit more about the clothing in just a second. Also, when you get outside of the big towns like Valladolid, Merida, you've got these really traditional homes that they still live in, right? So we have um, built a uh, very, you can see, keeps out the mosquitoes enough. That's the biggest concern here. People still sleep in hamacas. And actually, this isn't just indigenous people. This is a huge part of Yucat Yucatan, of the culture. Um, you'll have these big, beautiful houses in Merida with hammock cooks. So everybody sleeps in their hammock. I have a friend who came to visit here and she asked if she could bring her hammock. And I told her I didn't have anywhere for her to hook up her hammock in my guest room. So um, it's, it's pretty wild. It's definitely a part of the culture. Um, and, and it's interesting because so much of the culture is, is really tied together. It's very hard to separate the, the Spanish and the Maya in terms of culture. We'll see more of that. Um, later. So here's some examples of the clothing, as I mentioned. This is typical every day. You will see women walking around, including in, in Valladolid, in these uh, huipiles. And um, definitely in the communities, everybody's wearing these, right? This is a yerno, a little bit more traditional. Um, and then you'll see, this is really neat. They've taken these ideas and kind of modernized them. So it's this way of saying, I'm Yucateco or I'm Yucateca with this modern spin. Um, and this is neat. We're going to see the same kind of pattern in the language itself in just a couple slides. And actually, this just came out in the New York Times today. I was pretty excited about that. It's about a um, women's baseball team in Yucatan, in a small town in Yucatan. So I encourage everybody to Google it and check it out. It's a, it's a cool read. Um, playing each other and fighting machismo. All right, so as I mentioned, um, I did my research in, I do my research in Valladolid. So here we have that town that has kind of a more traditional, has that Spanish influence. You can hear it in the name, you see it in the streets, but you have all of these, they're called comunidades, right? So you leave, you drive, and everybody is living much more 
traditional lives, right? We have the, the houses, we have people working in the milpas right out back. Um, they're cooking there and they're making their tortillas, they're sewing, they're huipiles. It is a much more, um, the, the Maya culture is very much alive, you know, and if some people think of Maya, they think of way back in the day, but it's very much alive and, and very, very observable in these, in these comunidades. All right, so this is just a really quick overview of some of the features of Yucatec Maya. So again, we have a lot of languages spoken all throughout Mexico, but this big chunk here, this is Yucatec Maya, all spoken throughout this area. There are lots of Maya languages. They're all recognized as, as different languages. They're related, just like Spanish and Portuguese have a similar background, but they are not the same. They're, they're different languages, right? So Chol or Tutuhil or any of the other um, Maya languages would be own, their own unique languages. All right, so just a quick introduction. Um, so like Spanish, Yucatec Maya has five vowel sounds. We have the A, E, I, O, U, um, but we have four variations of each vowel sound. So we have the shortened, so I'm going to use A as an example. We have the shortened A, the elongated a, uh, the downward a, uh, and the rearticulated a. Uh, uh. When people slow it down to explain it, it's very easy to hear that difference. For me, as a speaker that does not have this tonal difference, it is very hard for me to understand the difference in real time. But it is absolutely, it's one of those things, if you grew up speaking a tonal language, you can hear that difference no problem. There's also what's called a glottal stop, and that's where we have kind of like a or like a stop in the back of our throats, right? So in Maya, there's a huge difference between ch and t, where we've stopped the air from coming out of our throat, right? We have t and we have t, t and t, and then p, right? So it's it's very clear. All of those sounds have both the the sound that is un that is not stopped. And then the sound that is stopped as well, that the has that glottal at the end. Maya does not have an uh, F, a C, a V, or an H. So you'll hear things like, um, I was talking with one woman who was talking about how her dad went to the market and he was trying to buy more light bulbs, more focos, but because there's no F sound, he was really struggling. So he decided to call them focos and they had a really hard time communicating that, right? So he, he couldn't, he really didn't get that sound so he found the next closest sound which was a p and that that did result in some confu confusion because pocos is a word in Spanish as well. Um, Maya does not have a copulative verb and a copulative verb is is right so um, whereas in English I would say I am Kate or in Spanish soy Kate uh, we don't need to do that in Maya so tené I Kate right no copulative verb there. We have a lot of information that's communicated with pre-verbal markers. So in Spanish, if you want to know if something was done in the past or in the future, a lot of times we can look to the verb at the end of the verb and find that information. But in Maya, a lot of times we have a word that's before the verb that communicates that information. So for example, tanin bin me ya. Um, more or less, I'm going to work. We have this tan meaning progressive, meaning it's an action in progress, right? In first person, bean, uh, go, may up work, right? So just a little bit about Maya. We're going to see more of it um, in the in the language section as well, but I just think it's fascinating. I love it. So first, we're going to take a look at Yucatec Spanish and just kind of get an overview, a holistic view of how people talk about Spanish, how people feel about Yucatec Spanish, and then we're going to take a more linguistic analysis of the language itself. All right, so what do we know about Yucatan and the Spanish spoken there? It's one of the areas of Latin America that most exhibits, that's most likely to exhibit indigenous language influence, right? So because of this contact with Yucatec Maya, it this um, the language contact effects have been observed quite frequently, right? And we're gonna we're gonna see that in just a second. It is known as a regional variety undergoing rapid standardization, and this has been noted in a lot of the research. So, Yucatec Spanish right now versus Yucatec Spanish fifty years ago has changed drastically, and a lot of that is because of globalization. So we have traditionally had a lot of isolation in Yucatan. Yucatan has been separated from a lot of other parts of Mexico. You know, it's got the, it's got the water, it's got the jungle. So we've had traditionally a lot of isolation and a lot of preservation of the Maya language because of that. 
Um, that of course is changing quite rapidly. Um, and so that is one of the reasons that the language is shifting or the dialect is, is losing some of its most marked features. There's also a regional pride. If you talk to a Yucateco, they are going to be very proud to be Yucateco. Um, they have a lot of um, social presence and everything, really communicating how special it is to be a Yucateco. Um, this Maya contact is definitely a huge feature of, the, um, of this peninsula and the language spoken there. We do see some big changes more recently due to increased amounts of education and dialect contact. So for now, we're just gonna talk about the two language contacts at the very end, we're gonna spin back around to dialect contact. But we do have um, in the town of Valladolid, for example, um, there are seven universities. Um, in Merida, there's even a branch of UNAM, right? So there is a lot, a heavy uh, emphasis on education and, and uh, families are really valuing that education as well. So we know that with education, we, we learn how to speak, right? And so a lot of the unique features that we've learned growing up from our parents or our grandparents, well, they get taught out of us, right? So that is one thing that changes the dialect of an area or the language of an area. All right, I have a couple examples that I'm going to show you of Yucatec Spanish, just so you can get right off the bat an impression. The first one is going to be some news. We're going to just listen to about 15 seconds. The one thing that I'd like you to listen for is I want you to listen for the sounds, how you feel about if it's really smooth or just how you feel about that. And the second one is a comedian. So she, she's being a little over the top. She's very famous in Yucatan, but I want you to hear some of the uniqueness. She's, she's up playing it, but she's up playing things that you definitely hear in Yucatan. So I'm going to open up these videos. All right, here's our first one, just about 15 seconds. Hola amigos, bienvenidos, que tengan un gran inicio de semana. Hoy tenemos muchísima información acerca del Tren Maya. Vamos a ver por lo menos tres videos que nos explican qué es lo que está pasando allá en el tramo 3 en Yucatán, porque hubo un confrontamiento entre dos grupos de sindicatos que la verdad es que quieren trabajar, las personas necesitan este empleo, pero ya saben... All right, so this one is a great example of, this is news. So they're trying to speak in a much more neutral um, we can say register so that they can appeal to a wider audience. But even still, you can hear some of that um, that that really marked uh, Yucatec Spanish coming through. So here's the second one. This one is quite fun. It's a little silly, so bear with me. We'll listen to about 20 seconds of this one. <laughs> Unas cosas aquí. Chichis es, eh, uh, ¿cómo se llama? Abuela, ¿no? Es, I'm, I'm sorry. Gosh, I'm not teaching. Um, so there are a couple things that I love here, right? We have uh, chichi, which means abuela. And then everybody in here is wearing weepil, including Alexa, which I thought it's very, I thought it was pretty entertaining. But you can hear even just imp impressionistically in the very beginning, you can hear this kind of breaking up of the different syllables and the different sounds. So we're going to get into a little bit more of exactly what that is, because that's one of the most obvious uh, features of the, um, of the uh, variety of Yucatec Spanish. Um, so most Yucatecos are exposed to Maya influence from a very early age. Um, very few people, there are a lot of people who don't speak Maya, but nobody has no contact with Maya because in the markets you have a lot of Maya spoken. There are a lot of um, contact with day laborers. And one thing that's really common is um, like nannies, um, people having nannies who are Maya speakers and they're coming in um, and, and speaking to them at least a little bit in Maya. So a lot of people are having uh, this um, 
this connection, right? So for example, this woman here, she, um, that she always had a, a nanny. So from very young, um, the people would come to their house and they'd only, they didn't know any Spanish, so they would speak in Maya. And so they would teach them some Maya. And as I mentioned before, this situation is changing a little bit. So this is the census that you can uh, see here. So we can see a big drop. This is the uh, Maya speakers. Um, and so we have a, a big drop in the um, number of Maya speakers. We do have a huge movement, especially coming from the university and some government movements um, with different success rates of really encouraging um, the acquisition of Maya as well. This is very similar to what we saw um, here in the U.S. with the learning Spanish. So we have a lot of people who um, their parents didn't teach them Spanish because of the negative the negative stereotypes that went along with it for a brief period of time. Now everybody is talking more positively about knowing multiple languages. And the same thing is happening in Yucatan where there were several people who they were embarrassed to know Maya, didn't want to teach their kids Maya because of the stigma. And now there's more of a push to, to encourage that Maya study again. Um, so there, there is that, there is that happening. All right, so here's some speech samples specifically. These are, these are some sounds, and we'll talk a little bit more about these, but um, some sounds that are specifically discussed in um, Yucatec Spanish is the ba-da-ga, and we're gonna get into details of that, the pataka, the glottal insertion, that, right? The pujada, which is kind of like you're beating the, the, each sound instead of making them smooth, and then the M, and the M, is when a word ends in N, they replace it with an M. So we're gonna talk about each of these later, but as you're listening to each of these sound bites, see if you can pick out any of these, any of the badaga, pataka, that n sound in the throat, or the, the pujada, or the word final M. Let's see what you can hear. A veces, si quieres a la persona, pero como dices, te cae mal lo, a lo que hace la persona, no es si la persona. For me, one of the things that jumps out here is lo que hace, right? We have that definite glottal stop in there where we wouldn't have that in other dialects of Spanish. Todo lo, lo que cae, lo que cae así, se ha, se ha mandado a componer. Todo, mandado, right? Um, a ver. A eso nos referimos. Oye, compra un sorbete, que sí que va a traer cono, cosa que en México dicen agua de limón. Agua de limón. Eso es that's something really unique there. All right, we're gonna come back and take a look at each of these in a little bit more depth, but I just wanted to give you some ideas of what we're working with here. Here's some opinions um, or uh, what people are saying about uh, Yucatec Spanish. So the first thing that you notice when you see people is their accent, right? You notice you can hear them and you think, oh, you are from Yucatan, right? So um, even if this one's saying, even if you don't know, a single word in Maya, your intonation is going to be different because of that contact with Maya. Um, and here we've got the Yucatec accent. It's, um, they're saying that that is a consequence of this contact with Maya. These are all articles, right? Um, with the exception of this last one. So intonation is paused and we have a lot of um, phenomena that reflect the native language or in this case, Maya. And then here is a, a speaker that, that was interviewed. So we have the fame as Yucatecs to speak pujada, right? Like it's beating um, and nobody in, like anybody else in Mexico and they make fun of it a lot. So uh, that's, we'll talk about that. All right, so uh, hablamos pujado, this idea. So this is kind of a forced, and it's um, like as if, like you're talking as if you're having a hard time explaining something, kind of breaking into your own speech, right? So that's one idea of this um, pujado. And then aporreado, this is something that, um, uh, people often say about Yucatec Spanish. And so here, this cartoon is very famous in Yucatan. Um, and so, wey, no se nota, uh, se te nota el aporreado hat. And we have somebody beating his teeth because it's when he's speaking, it's like he's beating out the sounds, right? So that's, um, this is a, a, a speaker from Yucatan or a cartoonist from Yucatan making fun of the way that Yucatecos speak. Um, here we have some more examples. I'm gonna, um, 
I think they've all been kind of shifted. Okay, there we go. I'm moving my video around. Um, so this kind of gives a variety of different um, speakers, but we're gonna take a listen and just kind of get situated. So this first person is a speaker from Mexico City, um, and it's just to kind of show a non yucatec Spanish, just to kind of get our ears ready. Que mi mamá me llevaba al kinder, mi mamá es maestra de primaria, entonces ella no tenía tiempo de cuidarme. All right, so next we're going to have a speaker, and, and this man is speaking in Maya. All right, so there is a chance that you thought, oh, wait, I understood some of that because you heard a lot of borrowings. There was ciudad and there was cuñada. Um, there were several words in there that are borrowed from Spanish. And this is very common in Maya. Um, we're, we'll talk a little bit more about those borrowings in just a minute, but um, you definitely can hear that. Things like pues, um, you'll definitely hear that in, in a... Um, monolingual Maya situation. All right, so now we have a Maya Spanish speaker, older, um, and we're gonna, you'll hear some of the features that we talked about that, but again, that mm, we'll talk about that, or we'll hear that in this audio. Pues ahora está bastante bien de antes, era un pueblo así muy abandonado. All right, oops, I'm sorry. I'm trying to move this little video to get it out of the way. Um, this next one, we've got a monolingual Spanish speaker, but from the area. Alvarado independizó, había domésticas. ¿Sabes qué es domésticas? ¿Como una criada? O... Las criadas eran domésticas. Ahí se morían en la casa y el patrón las enterraba. So here you can see she doesn't speak Maya, but you can still hear that very marked um, um, separation of sounds. Here we've got another monolingual speaker that's a, much younger. Una y media, dos, depende. Una, si termino más temprano. Y luego otra clase a las cuatro. Salgo hasta las nueve de la noche. So you can really hear a big difference between these two speakers that were born 70 years apart. You can definitely hear, um, and we're going to finish with a very young speaker. He eh, eh, hecho investigaciones. Y pues obviamente la gente de, de los pueblos Ya no hablan el maya tradicional porque precisamente hay una discriminación. All right, so you can really hear a difference, especially between the, this speaker born in 1915 and these two younger. I said a lot younger, but that's not true. This is not a very young speaker, um, but young compared to this first speaker. So we can really hear a lot of those traits. Um, and so as linguists, what we do is we really dive into exactly what's happening in each of these um, parts. Oops. There we go. All right, so we're gonna do that in just a second. So our performative aspects of Yucatec Spanish, we have um, young speakers who have kind of taken on this, um, this identity, this way of speaking Yucateco as a, as a kind of stereotypical, but they do it playfully and they use it as part of their identity. So, um, and, entonces ya todos hasta propósito lo hacen. So they're doing it on purpose. Um, o sea que te estás llevando con ellos o estás jugando, estás hablando, o sea, a propósito, marcas más tu acento. So you're talking and you're actively making an effort to mark your accent as Yucateco. So you can do this as part of your identity. And here we have a young Yucatec uh, Spanish speaker that says, it seems funny to us to play up that uh, Yucatec. So this is really similar to something that happened um, in Wolfram and Schilling Estes. Um, talking about Ocracoke and the example and uh, the accent that they've got in Ocracoke where people are really playing up that accent to form their identity and to communicate who they are as Ocracoke uh, residents. So here's an example from um, Twitter of people kind of playing up some of that, the Yucatan, um, the U Yucatec Spanish. So, um, hay lugar en el coche, hay lugar en el coche, um, Eh, República de Yucatán, 
doi, right? So here we've got a yucatam again. So people are really playing that up. We've got yucatam, smells like a pib spirit, yucatam. Um, we'll talk about pib a little bit later. So you can see that people are using this to really form their identity and to communicate that identity. And really, if you're not from Yucatan or familiar with Yucatan, you might not know that this is a, an identity marker, right? So you might read that and go, ooh, somebody misspelled Yucatan. But really, it's marking that identity and saying, hey, I am who I am. You may make fun of it a little bit, but this is who I am, right? So it's really cool that the youth are kind of, uh, young speakers are really taking that and owning that. All right, I'm skipping that last one. So we're gonna get a, um, a little bit deeper into the different parts of Yucatec Spanish. So I'm gonna give you a little overview of what we as linguists would look at. So what we just saw was kind of identity, overall perspective of the language. Here, we're gonna get into some nitty gritty. I'm gonna give you two cases from each. Uh, we're gonna look at the sounds of the language, the word formation, the sentence formation, and meaning formation. So we'll just give a couple examples of each. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to expand. Um, some of these come from other research and then some of them are just um, examples that I've heard that uh, they're on my long list of things to research and I haven't gotten to. So we'll, uh, we'll see all of those now. All right, so the sounds of Yucatec Spanish. So we talked a little bit about this. We have the ba, da, ga, and the pa, ta, ka. What happens is with the ba, da, ga in Spanish is we have two options we can say. So um, these are, we have we have two options for pronouncing the ba, da, ga, right? So we can say um, boy, right? Or me voy. We have the occlusive and we have the approximate is what they're called, right? So we have these two options that we as um, Spanish speakers decide between. One thing that's marked in Yucatan in Yucatec Spanish is the use of the approximate is not as common. So that's why every here, every time you see a b, d, a g, they're pronounced as b, d, g, and not b, d, g, right? Not the more soft version. So that's why you're hearing things like helado instead of helado, right? So that's one thing that's really um, particular about the, um, the b, d, g in Yucatec Spanish. Another thing that happens with the pataka is um, if you hold a piece of paper in front of your face and you're pronouncing the pataka, if you're an English speaker, that paper might move a little bit more because we have the plosive, we blow a little bit harder with our pataka usually. In Spanish, we're not getting a lot of movement with that paper. In Maya, we do have the option to get that. And we hear a more plosive version of the p, a very a much more aspirated version of p, T -k, when the Spanish is happening, right? So we heard a couple examples of that in the previous um, listening, uh, in the previous um, sound clips that we listened to. So pataka are shorter than pataka. We're gonna move on. So you can see a huge difference. As we mentioned, this dialect is really changing. And this research comes from Miknavis. All of this comes, he's done a lot of work on, um, on the sounds of Yucatec Spanish. So we have our p, t, k, b, d, g. So this is looking at just those forms. You can see that the regional variant is much higher for the older speakers. And this matches a lot with what we've said, right? So we have this Yucatec dialect um, that's much more marked with these features. And then the younger speakers are doing it a lot less. You can see they're doing it a lot more with things like t, right? Um, but you'll see the, the b is, significantly lower, not significantly, but definitely lower than the older speakers, right? So we're getting a lot more of that use of the approximate in addition to the inclusive. All right, so the second case that we're gonna look at is the absolute final M. Mm. Um, and so hacer chuk um, is dunk, right? Hacer chuk mi pam instead of pan, right? That's the example. And here's that same uh, cartoon from Yucatan. So um, we have, we see that it's, it's typically known that in highland varieties, we have n, lowland varieties, we'll get n at the end of a word, but m is exceedingly rare in Spanish. And uh, some people, Lipsky talks about how it's maybe even impossible. And yet it's in Yucatan, Yucatan, and it even kind of makes the identity of Yucatan, right? So the final n in Maya can surface as this m, and this is one thing that you will definitely hear. Um, in the older speakers and in the younger speakers as something, as an identity marker. This is not something that you hear as often walking around on the streets because this one is a little bit more obvious than the b, 
uh, um, so people have noted that that's a way that they sound um, more Yucateco, so they've they've made an effort to change that. A lot of speakers will comment on that. So if in a um, in a study that McNamis said he looked at, we've got 70% of the cases are n, mm, um, and we do have some cases of m. Mm, this should be n, mm, but we don't see that there. And then just leaving it off entirely is an option. But still, 20%, we do have that word final m, mm, which is really a unique feature of Yucatec Spanish. Um, I'm actually going to skip over the rhythm and move right to word formation. So word formation, this is called morphology. This is how we create words, right? So language contact has a couple unique ways in which we can create words. So the first way is we borrow them, right? This happens in every language. Um, we borrow words. We may or may not adapt them phonetically uh, to our language. That There are two options there. We can, we cannot. Um, and then we can also kind of mix and match the root and then the morphemes, the suffixes that we add on the end, for example, uh, from each language. And we're going to take a look at these. So um, I wanted to give an example of borrowings. This little paragraph comes from my Maya textbook that I use. So it's if we're learning about presentations. So if you're if you're looking, I'm not going to read all of this. Um, if you're looking at this, we see football, junio, años, novia. So we are seeing a lot of borrowings. You will note that things like football doesn't have an accent mark. Junio has two um, U's, which is that elongated vowel sound. Años doesn't have the tilde over the N because that doesn't exist in Maya. So we use the NY. And um, here the V doesn't exist. Uh, so we have no with the elongated um, o sound, vowel sound, bia, right, with the Y as well. So um, in terms of borrowings that are used every day, I sat down to come up with a list and oof, I, I didn't even know which ones to put on here because they're so common. And it's actually to the point where people don't even realize if the word is Spanish or in Maya, right? So a lot of words popping up. So I'm sure if we have any uh, foodies here, you might recognize cochinita pibil, uh, cochinita is is a pork, and this pibil, it pib is the um, is the way that it's cooked under the ground, right? So it's it's the way that they they heat up the coal under the ground to cook the food, and then they put the food underground. And this underground oven is the pib. Il is how we change a noun like pib into an adjective. Pibil is like of the pib, right? So this is a word they're using Maya grammar even um, in this borrowing. Uh, we have cenote. This is one example that has done has undergone a lot of adaptation. Sonot is cenote, but we have cenote in Spanish. Uh, one that everybody loves to teach when they hear you're uh, learning Maya, they're like, oh, do you know the word touch? That's your umbligo, your belly button. I don't know why everybody thinks that's so funny to teach. It is funny. Um, but yeah, tuch is your belly button. And alush, these are these little kind of creatures that um, they're kind of, they run around, they can cause trouble, and you have to kind of keep them happy. They they can um, not haunt a house or or an area, but they can cause trouble. They're, they're kind of mischievous. So you try to keep them happy um, in, in your area that you're living in. We're going to see Alush again in just a little bit. But there are so many examples. Um, uh, one, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. So one case of building, um, building words in a contact situation, we've got the case of nouns, right? So these are things. So we have the case of articles, right? So in Maya, we have an article. We have, we mark most things. It's kind of a, de, it's a general determinant. It's le, right? We mark everything with le. There is no gender uh, for things in Maya, like in English, right? So um, a table isn't feminine like it is in Spanish. Um, we just have these, um, it, it's just gender neutral, all things like in English. So borrowed words taken from Maya and used in Spanish often are used along with a determinant, a, an article that has gender. A lot of times this gender comes from the gender that's assigned in Spanish. So this word shish, um, it, it means it's like the little like crumbs. So a lot of times I had, I lived with a family and she would say limpia la shish, 
right? So that's kind of the stuff. She itself doesn't have a gender, but it's taken on that gender from Spanish and it's la shish, right? This is similar to Spanish, right? So in somebody who's doing some code switching using a noun in English, sometimes they'll use la house, right? So they've used um, the uh, gender of the noun itself. If you're gonna default, um, the default one is masculine, but um, a lot of times people do match that gender in Spanglish as well. So this is uh, this very much falls in line with what we see in Spanglish. The plural marker. So we have two cases we can borrow from Spanish to Maya and Maya to Spanish. And I've got an example um, of borrowing to Spanish, but the plural marker, marker in Yucatec Maya is oob, and it has that rearticulated o sound. And um, the pluralization rules are not the same, right? So technically, um, you really don't have to mark something if you have a word like um, a lot, or if you have a word like 25, if, if another item indicates that it's more than one, you don't have to mark it with the plural marker in Maya, which it makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, however, you'll see a lot of times when words are borrowed from Spanish into Maya that the if they need a plural form, like in años, like we saw in the last slide, they will borrow the singular or the plural form. So this is something that um, we see in, um, in Maya with the borrowings from Spanish. And then from Maya to Spanish, we usually see the case of um, the Maya word where we add the plural either S or ES in Spanish based on um, what, it, what the word ends with, right? So we had, um, the word alush, those little critters who cause problems, not problems, mis they're mischievous. Um, so cuidado hay alushes. So we've made it plural to follow the, um, the rules in Spanish using a Maya root. Um, and this is very common. You definitely hear these. Um, it would be very weird to say cuidado hay alush. Hay mucho alush. Typically, if you're borrowing, you would mark it with the... Um, Spanish pluralization marker. And this is very similar to other indigenous language contact. You see this a lot in like uh, Quechua Spanish. Uh, Spanish is spoken in Peru and Bolivia. You see these kinds of patterns with pluralization of nouns. So these are just two ways that we are incorporating borrowings into uh, Spanish or Maya. Another case is with verbs. And these are also two patterns that we see that um, that have a lot in common with Spanglish as well. So the first one we can do is morphological adaptation. And so here what we're doing is we're taking a word from one language and adding verbal endings of another language, right? So um, we see this a lot. So for example, Facebook, right? Facebook -ear. we hear that in, in Spanish here or um, um, Google -ear. Um, So we'll see this with uh, Yucatec Spanish with a word, this is, excuse the word, wish is uh, to urinate. Um, so a lot of people say, tengo que wishar, um, and that's, I have to pee, right? So we have wish, which is from Maya, and we've added ar to the end to make it a Spanish verb, wishar. Then we have a Spanish word with a Maya ending. Um, this um, is kind of uh, an interesting thing that I, I would really like to study a little bit more. So we have the verb creer or to believe. We've taken that root of creer, modified it, creer, and then added the, the endings to reflect verb type creer. So we do see this going both ways, both from a Maya root with Spanish endings to a Spanish root with Maya endings as well. So it, it's definitely a two way. Um, two-way street. Another thing we see is the light verb adoption. So it, absolutely there exists a verb for um, to hug, right? So, but what we'll have is a lot of people, hacer loch is to hug. A loch is a hug. And actually it's, it's interesting because Maya and um, Maya verbs and nouns, there's really easy ways to use a word as both a noun and a verb. They're just marked a little bit differently. So loch is hug a noun, and then you can make it into a verb pretty easily. In Spanish, of course, they're gonna know what you mean by abrazar, but here, if you wanna hug somebody, you would te hago loch, right? And you're gonna, you're gonna hug them in that way. And again, these are both really common in Spanglish as well. Sentence structure. So uh, the case of pronouns, pronouns are these I, you, she, we, 
Um, in Spanish, this it's pro drop, which means we can use it or we cannot use it. So Ana está en la cocina, está co cocinando. We can use it or we cannot use it. Why? Because this morphology on the verb kind of lets us know who's doing it. And if it's contextually, conversationally still available, we'll understand that Ana is the one who is doing the cooking, right? So in uh, Yucatec Maya, we have three kinds of pronouns. We're not really going to get into them here, but we mark all of our verbs with a pronoun. You can't have the pronoun, I'm sorry, you can't have the verb without the pronoun. So um, what Minkovitz finds is that there's higher rates of pronoun use in Yucatec Spanish, um, especially those um, who are bilinguals, um, which could be an effective bilingualism. It could be effective language contact. We can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, but you definitely find higher use of pronouns. And we find a similar thing in some of the language acquisition studies um, in, in English and Spanish as well, because English is not pro-drop and Spanish is, we find speakers, uh, L1 speakers of English learning Spanish often overproduce pronouns. So we see a similar thing happening in Yucatan. This is um, something I've noticed. This is going to be a very short, Thing, but this is very cool and I cannot wait to study this. So I have heard a couple things like el hizo bañar. So instead of conjugating that verb to reflect the person as we would in Spanish, el se baño, right? Um, they, are, you, they are inserting hacer, and this is different than hacer loch. That's a, there we have a noun, I'm sorry, a verb and a noun. Here we have two verbs. And so I was thinking, what is happening here? And to me, I think think, this is my hypothesis, I really have to study this, but I think it's super cool. Yucatec Maya marks completed versus incomplete action, right? So a perfective or imperfective. So we have, um, this is, um, um, I get dressed, and this is the incompletive, imperfective, and this is the I got dressed. So the difference here in, in English would be the tense, right? I'm communicating that tense. We say that Yucatec Maya is a tenseless language because we're not so concerned about present, past, all of that in terms of the verbal morphology. We really just mark um, whether it's a complete action or an incomplete action. So hacer, and we do this prior to the verb. So here we have um, the completive marker, the first person, and then... So I think that's what's going on here. We're marking this verb pre-verbal to say done. It's not that he bathes every day, it's that he's done, he did it right. Hypothesis, love to hear your thoughts. All right, here's just a fun fact before we move on to meaning. Um, buscar and encontrar. So buscar means to look for and encontrar means to find, but actually, Encontrar is not used much in Yucatec Spanish, which is super cool. Um, if you listen uh, or if you hear an example like this, uh, ¿Qué pasó con tu tarea? ¿Te la perdiste? ¿Sabes? La buscaba por mucho tiempo y por fin la busqué. So we're using that same verb saying, I was looking for it for a while and in the end I found it. And this is interesting because really, if you think about it, this, the whole action is looking for. So this is the process, the incompletive, I was looking for it, and this is the terminative, right? This is how it ends. So it kind of makes sense that you could use the same verb and just change the verbal morphology, just change the um, perfectivity of the verb. So this is something that it's just a little fun fact that I think is super cool. If you go to uh, Yucatan and you use the verb encontrar, they might correct you and say, actually here, we don't use that verb. So it's just a little fun fact. All right, meaning, I'm going to geek out a little bit more on this one because this is, this is my jam. Um, so I study the subjunctive in Yucatec Spanish, um, and the subjunctive, I'm going to get really, really brief overview. It communicates possibility, right? So we have a couple options. We can, we talk about assertive, asserted. So if we're asserting something, we're going to use the indicative. If we're saying it's true, we're going to use the indicative. We can presuppose something, which is kind of like assuming it's true, but we're not asserting that it's true, right? And then um, we're going to use the subjunctive there. And then if it's neither asserted nor presupposed, we'll use the subjunctive as well. We learn in classes about a lot of verbs that trigger and license. We're not going to go into all of that now, but just know that there are typically verbs that license one or the other. So I'm going to, I'm sorry, let's start with this. Contact varieties. So the big variety that's been studied most is U.S. Spanish. And so this is one of the 
the canonical studies and uh, Silva Corvalan studied subjunctive and found a reduced system that made it more difficult to distinguish between more or less possible situations in hypothetical worlds. And the conclusion is that this simplified or um, reduction in subjunctive represents um, a, a smaller system of mood, right? And I wanted to know if that was what was going on in Yucatan, because I had heard a couple things. So the first study that I did um, was I looked at three, or I'm sorry, four areas, or three in this paper, um, three areas in which the subjunctive in certain contexts, the subjunctive will be triggered, and in other contexts, the indicative will be triggered. So pretty much, I just want to go over like the biggest contributions of each of these studies. So the biggest thing that I found was that monolinguals and bilinguals produced um, this differently, right? So the subjunctive was different for these two speaker groups. Bilingual speakers produced higher rates of subjunctive overall, which I thought was really unique because I was going in expecting, remember that simplification. Um, and then also there's a statistically significant difference. Um, bilingual speakers sub, uh, accepting subjunctive at higher rates than monolinguals uh, when the indicative was what I was anticipating. So that was something that really called out, um, made me interested. So it's kind of a overuse of the subjunctive. No difference between production and evaluation, which is something we see a lot in um, the U.S. Spanish studies or acquisition studies here in the U.S. Um, but there could be some, there's some trends there. And then there's no evidence of simplification. So as this, as happens a lot with research, this kind of led me to the next question of, well, then what's going on overall with the mood in Spanish? I wanted to get just an overview. So I wanted to test specifically three types of verbs. So volition, these are, um, these across the board will uh, license subjunctive. So these are like, quiero que sepas, right? We have emotives, which there's really a good amount of um, variation here. Um, so it's kind of like me gusta que sometimes uh, licenses the subjunctive, sometimes licenses the indicative. So we, I was expecting a little bit of um, variety there in the answers. And then the epistemic, this is like um, sé que, estoy segura que. So this is reflecting how you see the world. Typically, these are um, separated by affirmative and negative, right? So our affirmative is indicative, negated is uh, subjunctive. So I ran everything together and um, speaker group of bilingual versus monolingual was significantly different. Monolingual scored higher, um, which meant more what was anticipated, more uh, towards the anticipated responses. Also gender had a significant difference, which was neat. Women scored higher than men, which supports other sociolinguistic patterns that we see in other studies. And this is neat. So we were anticipating the subjunctive in these areas, and we see a little bit of indicative use. If this study were done in US Spanish, we would see really low rates of subjunctive and high use of indicative because what we see happening in US Spanish mood is the decrease in the use of subjunctive in certain areas. This is where it gets cool. So we're expecting um, all indicative here, right? But we see that we have a really high use of the subjunctive, especially for these epistemic uh, interrogatives. These are um, one part of it. So we have these really high percentages of um, use of subjunctive when we were expecting the indicative with interrogatives, or I'm sorry, with epistemics. We have um, all three of these epistemics showing some really cool data. So, um, yeah, some overall conclusions from that study. The volitional verbs, they behave like we expected. Emotive, we see some um, similarities to other varieties of Spanish, especially spoken in Mexico. And uh, Yucatec Spanish does some really cool things with these epistemic predicates. So I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper to what's going on with epistemics. And again, epistemicity just studies the way that we communicate how we see the world. So I sat down and did some interviews with speakers and they gave me preferences. So um, uh, we have an example. We always contextualize in semantics to really take out any ambiguity of meanings. We contextualize really clearly. I'm going to move the sofa and I ask my neighbor if her husband can help me. She says not now, but she thinks he's available this afternoon. Typically, in a lot of varieties of Spanish, this would uh, license the indicative. However, um, 
out. However, we see that it licenses the subjunctive in a lot of the cases, right? So um, what I am suggesting that is that it actually, in Yucatec Spanish, we have a kind of different way to look at some of these structures. And I do think there's a split between the bilingual and monolingual. So I am suggesting that the bilingual grammar is completely different than the monolingual grammar. This is a big say, but I stand by it. I think these bilingual speakers, people who know Maya, are using what's called non-veridicality, this idea of um, it's not true, it's not false, it's that somewhere in the middle. When they see any kind of that like somewhere in the middle interpretation, that's when they're using the subjunctive. It's not necessarily uh, the verb that you have in your sentence or the structure that you have, it's that uh, un unsureness. And of course, there are some structures that lend themselves more to um, being uncertain of something, right? So negation can sometimes do that, saying no. Uh, modals like, well, it could be that. Um, downward entailing quantifiers like few people, we're gonna see an example of that, and interrogatives. If you're asking a question, clearly that's quite a situation with um, uncertainty. So these are all areas in which the subjunctive is used much higher rates. Um, in bilingual speakers. Monolingual speakers in this area do pattern much more with uh, canonical subjunctive use, right? So following the trigger of the affirmative versus negated or, so they're following much more of what we would expect from other dialects of Spanish, whereas our bilingual speakers are really kind of following this non-veridical theory. So as semanticists, I just wanted to show you one quick, um, this is what we do, right? So we take formulas and we put language into formulas to take out any, any ambiguity. So what the subjunctive means and what the indicative means, this is a formula that should really lay it out. So I'm just gonna walk really quickly through this. So the indicative, if we have a context and a world, like possible worlds, this is the assigning factor. We have a proposition, anything you're gonna say, and a world, all of those world, uh, all of those propositions are tr true in that world. So there are no worlds in which that proposition is false just true, straight away. Subjunctive is used, on the other hand, when we have a proposition in a world, and in some worlds, the proposition is true, and in some worlds, the prop proposition is false. So this is logic. If you have questions about the logic, I'm happy to go into that more um, during the q and I'm gonna skip over that. Um, so as, as I mentioned, we see a big difference between the monolingual and the bilingual speakers. So in conclusion, these projects kind of built, which was really nice. Um, so these doxaxa predicates, these are belief predicates where you're expressing your belief. We're expecting um, there to be a negation, positive divide, right? Um, so like, um, uh, creo que es la verdad, no creo que sea la verdad is the anticipated, but we're not seeing that in these bilingual speakers. Instead, the subjunctive communicates this maybe or maybe not, right? So I've only studied embedded clauses, but um, for example, I got this off of Facebook. Um, so this is a written um, example, uh, mañana probablemente tengas que pagar, right? So here we have a use of the subjunctive. It might be the case that a word's missing, like K deletion, that might be the case, but also I've heard things like this. So um, I think this is uh, definitely a good argument for the idea that that grammar is a little bit different. So is this a case of, this is the final thought, is this a case of contact? Well, Yucatec Maya um, has the subjunctive. Here we have the subjunctive here. However, the subjunctive communicates um, future realization in other possible worlds like counterfactuals, like if I had gone, I would have gotten the money, right? Um, or past temporal reference. So this is clearly, this has nothing to do with the subjunctive in Maya. So that doesn't help us at all. However, if we look towards epistemics, we actually in Maya mark epistemic or this, this is how I see the world idea with a marker called meme, right? And it's used to communicate conjecture, possibility, and reference. Somebody is, uh, Bricker's uh, translated it to, I suppose, uh, the Maya popular dictionaries, creo que quizás a lo mejor. So these are all communicating that like maybe, maybe not idea, right? Um, so, and there's also some other uses for it beyond direct conjecture. It can be kind of like a play speech, right? So where is Mateo Balin? Or maybe you gave him away, right? So obviously nobody gave somebody away, but they're using that to kind of play with the language a little bit. So um, the speaker knows that the address he has not given him away. 
but um, we can use that to comically introduce this idea of like maybe, and that's we're creating humor with this epistemic, playing with that epistemic. And this is something that we see a lot in language contact. So um, we've seen it with Andean Spanish. Um, the pluperfect is used in, in La Paz uh, to communicate that evidential idea. These are evidentials are features that exist in Maya, but do not, or in Quechua, but do not exist in Spanish. They exist lexically, we'll talk about that. But um, people use other grammatical features. It's this idea that I wanna communicate an idea, but I don't have a grammatical way to do that in this other language. So I'm gonna use something else. And so speakers of Yucatec Spanish have recognized that like possibility meaning of the subjunctive. So they're using that subjunctive to communicate that conjectural meaning that you can with the epistemic marker. Um, you also see it in Ecuadorian Spanish. Um, and uh, Andrew Boy says, this is just an exciting little slide for me. Mean is unique because it really communicates conjecture P or like maybe P or maybe not P, which is beautiful because it matches so beautifully with the, um, my definition of the subjunctive that I came up with. So I was super excited about that. So lexical conjecture is something we see a lot in Spanish, right? And we, we see it in English too. Um, so, uh, in Spanish, we have disque, which is heard in Colombia, Mexico, and Ecuador. And the semantic values of disque may differ. So it has this like, uh, I'm not saying this, but it's said. And we see this in Yucatec Spanish as well. There's a lot of se dicen, se dicen when they're introducing. And it's not really, they're not necessarily introducing the idea as it is said. It's kind of more of this lexical conjecture marker. So I want to end on just this idea of contact effects. We've been talking about the idea of these two languages in contact, but contact is not limited to languages. It can also happen with varieties. Um, so we have, because of globalization, we have a lot of changes happening in, um, in our languages. So I wanted to take a look at the case of Yuka Presa, which is a new um, variety that is popping out in Yucatan. Um, a presa is... <laughs> Um, somebody who has a lot of money. And this is something, they have presas all over the place. This is not something uh, particular to Yucatan. It's a very Mexican thing, right? So a presa speaks in a certain way, right? There's a certain way that they talk. For example, they might do more, it's called up talk, where they end each sentence by going up, even though it's not a question. So this is a very uh, common feature of a presa uh, variety. And we have the case of yuca presas. So I'm going to pull that up really quickly, let me move my videos. And so I'll just, we'll listen to two women. Toda la Semana Santa se van de misiones. Número cuatro. So here we can hear, so here we can see um, traits of both Yucat Yucatan, of the Yucatec Spanish, and some of that presa where it's going up at the end. This is definitely an area that has not been studied that I love. Unfortunately, I'm getting most of my data from, tic or fortunately, I'm getting most of my data from TikTok, um, but it's a very cool area to look into. So overall conclusions, Yucatan is amazing. Plan your next trip, go. Um, there's a lot of contact effects from words to sounds, to words, to meanings, um, everywhere. New varieties are being formed every day like Yuca Fresa and come take a linguistics class with us. That's it. So thank you, gracias, Dios Plotik. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, in, in um, we have a bunch of different questions, but before we do, uh, while I was uh, listening to your presentation, um, um, I also think that I never asked you how to pronounce your last name. And since I don't want to butcher it, can oh. you please tell me how to pronounce it? Bove. Bove. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bove. Yeah. Um, I really, really appreciate it. This was, you know, for someone who's not a linguist, who's just a Mexican, and of course, uh, who has traveled to Yucatan to to a lot of places in Mexico, this was fast. It, it was really fascinating. Also, as someone who learned English as a second language, right, a Spanish speaker, I can see a lot of these really interesting 
patterns of language acquisition too. So, so thank you. Um, I have some questions of my, of, of my own, but I, I really want to let uh, some of our participants ask their questions first. So I'm gonna uh, start with them. Uh, Valeria Santos asks, how many people speak actual Mayan, not Mayan slash Spanish? Is it possible to talk and understand real Mayan, not Mayan slash Spanish? Yeah, absolutely. So there are definitely people who are monolingual Yucatec Maya speakers. They, the number of these speakers is going down significantly. Most of the monolingual Maya speakers are older. Um, I've met several um, who we really have a hard time communicating because my Maya is very limited. Um, and so I have a, somebody who I go with who helps me um, with some of the interviews and ask for stories. Um, it's much more common for people to have both, both languages going on. Um, and that the number of people who speak both definitely um, increased, but there are millions of people who speak Maya. So this isn't just a tiny language. Um, this is definitely a very used. And everybody, if you go to Yucatan, you can ask anybody to teach you a word in Maya and anybody can. They might say, well, I don't know any, but I know that tuch means belly button. So it is, it's definitely everywhere. That's awesome, thank you. Ebed uh, Zizdiam uh, asks, based on pronunciation and lexicon, is the Yucateco identity manifested in the whole Yucatan Peninsula? That's a great question. So I think that Yucatan identity, yes, it's manifested in the whole peninsula. I think the rates at which certain things manifest would be different in different places. Absolutely. Um, that's a really good point. Presenting the entire peninsula as if it were one language is wrong. Um, however, we can kind of capture a lot of those patterns and show um, general trends that we can see everywhere, probably to different rates in different places. That's a great question. And, and Edward had another question, um, so I'll ask it right now. Uh, he was very interested in the El Se Hizo Bañar uh, that you mentioned, and he actually um, asks, what would be the morpheme of the completed action? Is, it, is this possible to conjugate in other contexts? Yeah, absolutely. So um, here we have we uh, have a marker that we add to the person. So it's, it's very small. It's the difference between a K being our... Um, incompletive and our T being our completive. And that's it. So it's the difference between keen and teen. Um, and so that small marker would be, so it is unique because we, it's not like we're marking completive and not marking incompletive, um, but we are, we're marking both in a unique way, but there it is, it could be the case that the speaker in that moment is like, but I want to mark that it's definitely done. And so they're trying to come up with how to do that. And what better way to do that would then with this verb, hacer, that's used for so many different purposes, we can make it perfective, make it ending, make it clear that it's done, stick it in front of the verb, and it kind of communicates something similar. I am definitely simplifying. It is a long shot. It is an idea that I have. If people have thoughts, I would love to talk about it because this just seems so cool and just a pattern that I found and a hypothesis I have. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that, that really interested me in that, uh, made, made me interested in that example also is um, how when some of my friends uh, learn Spanish, they sometimes, um, that, that are English speakers, right, they sometimes eat the se part of bañar because it doesn't, you don't put it before in English, you put it at the end of the words, I think. And so I wonder if also something like that happens. I mean, do you could take also the person, the, I don't know what the part of speech is because I'm not English, but you know, the said, the, the making it appropriate, el se bañó, right? Mm -hmm. uh, o, o te bañaste, o te, te bañaste. Those two different exceptions of putting it before as a separate word and then putting it at the end in the word itself, do they exist in, in Yucatec too? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I, I don't think so. So there is a reflexive marker in Yucatec Maya, but it goes before the verb and you can't move it. So that idea of like, um, me voy a bañar, voy a bañarme, that flexibility in that case doesn't exist. There is flexibility in word order in Maya, but um, not with the, these pre-verbal markers really have to go right before the verb. 
very, very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Niam Kelly um, asks, thank you for the great talk. Uh, with regard to the pujada style, has anyone looked at rhythm in these varieties? I know that syllable versus stress timing is controversial, but the clip sounded distinctly, distinctly syllable time to me. And I wonder if anyone has measured this. Yes, um, this the name that I've mentioned a couple times, Miknovitz has worked with a couple um, with one rhythm study that I think is actually in press right now. So to answer your question, only very recently has this been worked on. Um, I can absolutely, if you contact me, if you shoot me an email, I can send the paper along to you. I can put you in contact with him. Um, I don't know a lot about um, rhythm and it, this is one of the areas that I'm not as familiar with, but I definitely can put you in contact with um, that author because it is, I know there were some really uh, unique patterns that came up um, and it was statistically significant. They compare, I'm, I'm a little over my head on that one, but yes, um, definitely has been studied, but only recently. You know, the, uh, Niem's uh, question gives me um, put to something that I was thinking too when I uh, was, listening to those examples and definitely the rhythm of the older Mayan speaker um, is uh, um, very similar. So, so the older uh, uh, Yucatec speaker, Yucateco speaker was very different to the Mayan, right? Very with those pauses, with hard endings, with, but the rhythm also was very similar. And the newer generation to me sounded incredibly similar to the accent of the rhythm of Ciudad de Mexico, Chilangos like me, right? Um, really, really similar. So that was really fascinating too. I know uh, that's not your expertise, but, but you know, I thought um, that was very interesting. Yes. Um, let me ask you the next question from Laura Ramirez. Uh, are there negative words in Maya like uh, not as in do not eat those or we are not going there? Yeah. Um, this is a great question. So um, ma is no. And actually one cool thing that you can do about maya is a lot of times you'll have a, a prefix at the beginning and a suffix at the end that kind of envelops a word. So um, a lot of times we have ma at the beginning and e at the end. So you would take whatever you want to negate and do ma e. And the cool thing is you can negate a word you can negate a couple words, you can negate an entire sentence. So that ma is how you negate and we have a lot of freedom. It is common to leave off the e at the end. Uh, it's kind of like in French, how you have some options with you know, the two negative particles, but people just use pa. Um, it's like that, but people would just use the ma at the beginning and that's how you, how you know whatever they're about to say, they mean, nope. Yeah, great question. That is great. Um... Yvette Navarro asks, how does linguistic nationalism influence Yucatec Maya language? Ooh, great question. So um, I think right now is a really cool time to be looking at this um, because um, right now there's a lot of value being placed. Um, so you'll have um, for example, government officials wearing weepy. You'll have um, government activities being translated into Maya. So it's nice. The effectiveness of all of this, I don't know that we really could get into that. I don't know how effective it is, but it is the first step in that people are recognizing the importance of Maya culture and language and incorporating it into things that, honestly, it should have been incorporated in for years, but only now is it happening. So it, it is a neat time now um, that this identity is being reflected in, in more areas, including the, the social political sphere. Um, but again, there's a lot more to go. These, uh, the Maya community, I would say are, are pretty significantly underrepresented. Um, the idea that, the Mayas live this beautiful balanced life with um, the Spanish speakers is, is very false, right? So, um, but it is, I, I do think there's some movement in the right direction. Students are learning some Maya. It's kind of like how um, we learn Spanish in elementary school. They'll take a couple Maya classes, but still it's giving value to this idea that other languages have worth, right? So it, there's some movement in the right direction, definitely. I, I certainly hope so because you know 
the fact the, the the trends that you showed at uh, the beginning of the talk are very worrisome, right? Uh, some of of the the languages and the specific sub languages that we have in the, in those regions are disappearing rapidly, um, and uh, you know. Mexico and and the Mexican government uh, before and after the revolution did a really great job of you know creating this new form of nationalism that kind of really subverted uh, and 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 quashed uh, anything that was not Mexican, whatever they considered Mexican, right? So it, it is very sad, and and I do I am glad to hear that you know not only the government and other organizations are trying to push for recognition and, and more acceptance and, and more um, efforts in this direction, uh, but that also they're gaining track, which is good. Of course, hopefully a lot more gets done. You're, as, as you mentioned, you know, the situation of, of most of the, not only the Mayan, most of the indigenous groups in Mexico is deplorable. And, and you know, as a country we've done it an awful job uh, at including them. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep on the, uh, on the questions about language though. Zachary uh, Wutan asks, with the research you've done, could we apply some of this information to other language variations like English between uh, American English and English English? Yes, absolutely. So this is one of the cool things about this kind of research is, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking up exactly what Yucatec Spanish is, I'm looking at the patterns, but at some point I have to take a step back and say, okay, big picture, what is this telling us, right? So um, for example, taking a look at the mood. So um, the previous research, most of the previous research says there's simplification. If you know two languages, the mood's gonna simplify, it's gonna go down, right? So I'm finding all this about Yucatec Spanish where actually that's not the case. I take a step back and I'm like, wait, I get to challenge this idea, right? This idea that in language, and this doesn't just apply to Spanish, right? It could apply to other languages. If you have two languages or two dialects, whatever it is, they're not necessarily gonna simplify. It might be the case that they simplify, but it might not. And so this, this idea very much can be, we can use that to look at um, Southern US English compared to British English. Absolutely, um, these kinds of ideas. Um, obviously not subjunctive because we don't have that in, in uh, English, but some other idea like, well, English, um, I, I hear this kind of re um, intonation in this variety of English. Let's compare if somebody speaks English and another language, how does that affect? We absolutely can apply these ideas to other languages, other dialects. And really, as linguists, we should be informing that body of research, like beyond just our one micro uh, study environment, we need to really be kind of channeling our information up and saying, well, what does this tell us about language? What does this tell us about language speakers? What does this tell us about bilingualism, right? So definitely, great question. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we've run out of time, but we're going to continue because there's so much interest, there's so many questions. Uh, I have <laughs> a, at least three more questions. So great. this speaks us uh, uh, to not only how interesting your research is and your presentation was, but, you know, also how uh, good of a, a speaker and presenter you are. So Ryan Smith asks, hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. I'm a semanticist at UTEP and was curious about the semantics for the subjunctive. I may be missing some details, but I'm wondering about the at issueness of the contribution of the subjunctive. I'm blanking on examples, but if an example were something like they said that they sell subjunctive flowers, uh, the at issue meaning would be they say that they sell flowers and would be the subjunctive to to and would the subjunctive be contributing to a non at issue meaning like the one you suggested the speaker considers both they sell flowers and they don't sell flowers to be live possibility is that yeah clear? absolutely absolutely that is very much a possibility i would love to sit down with you and talk about that Think, I mean, yes, I, I hadn't thought about it from an at issuedness perspective, but that very much could be the case that we are indicating a non at issue. Ooh, yeah. Yes, please email me. I, I was going to say fantastic. Uh, 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 Ryan, please email Dr. Bove uh, 
maybe you have here a, a great collaboration in the future. Absolutely. Um, uh, Valeria Santos asks, what is the Maya work uh, for Pivil? I'm oh, guessing so it's Pivil. Pivil, right? P. Yeah, Pivil, yeah. So um, if you have somebody saying in Maya that they're gonna go um, prepare the Pib, they'll just, they'll use Pib and Pivil is, is like the adjective form, right? Um, so you you would make the Pib and then whatever you cook in the Pib, that would be, you know, like cochinita or um, pollo Pivil. Um, yeah, so whatever you're making is Pibil. And actually, if you were to ask somebody in Yucatan what it's called, they'll say Pib. If they're a Spanish speaker, they'll say Pib, and they, they won't have another word for it. That's just everybody knows it as that, um, and it comes from Maya. So that's one of those cases where we have a borrowing from Maya, where um, it didn't, we're borrowing it because of necessity, because the word didn't exist for this thing in, in Spanish. And um, uh, as as Dr. Bove uh, also explained, in case uh, this is what you're wondering, Valeria, uh, uh, the pib is the form of cooking inside this hole in the ground. It's different in its particularities, but similar to many other cultures where, like in Abai, where they actually make a hole and, and put the pig in the ground and cover it with uh, uh, dirt, other things, right? Um, and it's a certain time of year. It's actually right around this time of year that everybody brings out or, and they go and they dig their pee. And um, um, the the families who have the young people who can dig are the ones who get the pib going for the, the community and, and they get they get all the food ready. Yep. Uh, and if you have never tried it, it's so delicious. <laughs> uh, Teresa Fuentes asks, do you know if there is a resurgence in Quechua? I am looking to learn, but not sure where who to go to? Oh, they, um, I would say definitely email me. Yes, there is. It's um, it's a lot like Yucatec Maya in that there are a lot of speakers. So with Quechua, we're not worried about revitalization or like trying to get everybody to uh, speak it so it doesn't die. We have there are a lot of speakers of Quechua, um, and um, now we're at the point where you can take some classes at universities. You can take classes online. So if you're interested in learning Quechua, definitely good resources. There's also lots of opportunities to go and study in Peru or, or uh, Bolivia and learn some and learn some Quechua. Um, so definitely, if you're so, if you're interested in specifics, you can shoot me an email. I'm happy to kind of lead you, make some suggestions because we definitely need more Quechua research. There you go. Great. <laughs> Um, one last question from our, um, excuse me, from our participants, uh, Edward Tiziam also asks, where does the pujado concept come from? I am not sure. This is just something that people, I just heard people saying, and, and it's something that I would almost promise if you ask somebody about Yucatec Spanish in Yucatan, I almost guarantee that they will use this word. Um, it's kind of like if you ask somebody about um, certain di other dialects of Mexico where it's very common to hear, they, it's like they're singing. So it's kind of just become this, that's what people say about the dialect. It's, it's just um, a very popular, and I think a couple people said it, a couple people saw that they could kind of see that, and people kept repeating it, and uh, yeah, and it just kept going. Yeah, and... Uh... I, I have a couple of questions, but um, I, I don't know if we'll have time to ask them, but I'll ask one at least. Uh, yeah. Do you know if some of the interjections that happen in the Yucatec Spanish come from the Mayan, like the ya, the mare, all of these things, do they actually come from the uh, Mayan? Yes, yes, absolutely. Way, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh -huh. um, uh yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely. You see it everywhere. Actually, and I wasn't going to say this in the presentation because it's a bad word, but um, one of the most common, you know, you like stub your toe, hit your elbow, um, break something, you say pelana, which is like the ha in Yucatan. And that, that comes from my, Maya. It actually means like the, the private parts of your mom. And so a lot of people don't realize when they're yelling that, that that's what they're yelling in Maya. Um, but it's very common. A lot. I mean, it's used all over Yucatan. Actually, I saw it on a keychain when I was in Mexico City. <laughs> so that that is awesome. That is really, really interesting and great because it it kind of speaks to the ways in which 
even though there's colonialism and assimilation and generally, right, uh, we end up losing the languages of the less powerful um, parts of society, that there's ways in which those actually get into the speech in, in, in the actual Spanish. So I'm, I'm really happy about to, to, to know that. Um, yeah. um, okay, well, I, I could actually talk to you all day. So I, I, one of these days, I'm gonna uh, have to uh, sit down with you and, and learn more from you. Perfect. Um, uh, well, Dr. Bobe, thank you so much. This was incredibly interesting. And um, we really were so honored that, that you did a presentation for us and you closed our fall series speakers. Um, so thank you, I, we appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate everybody who took the time to come and the questions, they were awesome. If anybody has any other questions or any other ideas for research, this is a very under-researched area. So if you're like, I like linguistics and this could be, contact me, please email me, kp, like Peter Bove at gmail. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, please shoot me an email. I would love to sit down and talk with you about any of it. Yes, we just put Dr. Bove's uh, email on our chat. So if you are, please copy it uh, and do contact her. Um, I want to uh, also thank all of you for being here um, and for making our fall speaker series incredibly successful. Um, from the bottom of my heart as the faculty fellow for the Center for Latin American Studies, I thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us every month. And uh, we have more really interesting talks to come next semester. Um, I appreciate it. Have a great end of your year. See you next semester.